outset uh, for this once edition for ai pe charcha i extend my gratitude and thanks to google for uh, giving such a stellar panel of uh, speakers experts you know, who have been uh, working on ai projects on machine learning on using data science and in what ways governments can, across the world can use these technologies for improving public service delivery today's time it could not have been like more relevant given the pandemic that we are facing given the surge in cases we are having given the predictions people are looking for when will the when will the curve bend and how more how many more cases we'll see how many more deaths we will see what all is required how do we do planning how do we do forecasting so all that are our problem statements that are typical uh, use cases for technologies like ai so so it's uh, very relevant in today's cause we have like today in this uh, in this edition of ai pe charcha ai pe charcha incidentally is a session that we have done it's like a discussion on artificial intelligence and how to adapt it quickly and especially in the public space what we need to do is that uh, while the researchers and the technologists across the world in our universities and all are working on developing new tools and techniques for ai and machine learning but how do you make use cases uh, widespread how do you do adoption of something i believe i have read about something that google had done for flood forecasting in bihar patna and that 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 experiment can be replicated elsewhere it can ensure that people get the right advisories well in time in order to save lives in order to save livelihoods so the so similarly in the agriculture science we have had several applications of ai in which uh, farmers are given predictions with regard to when to sow what to sow uh, how much fertilizers they should use and about uh, disease uh, diagnosis also in which they can click pictures of uh, the leaves or uh, whatever disease they are seeing in their crops send it by image and then they can get a reply back with regard to what they must might be doing to address that similarly in healthcare there have been several applications of ai whether it's in the field of diabetic retinopathy or breast cancer breast cancer diagnosis so so while several solutions are there they are spoken about in various conferences in various workshops but how do you make them universal how do you adapt them how do you ensure that more and more state governments start using that so that's the objective with which we started the ai pe charcha series in which we get practitioners we get researchers we get people who have worked with it deployed it in in uh, various uh, parts of the world and and give simple tips and toolkits for replicating it elsewhere so we have today in this uh, in this edition of ai pe charcha participants from all over the country from all the states we have it secretaries we have mission directors from state government from uh, various government of india ministries who are attending the uh, attending session will be keen to learn from the experts in the earlier editions of ai pe charcha also we have got experts speaking on language technologies on natural language processing on diagnostics and trying to use it for various applications in the field of ai and machine learning india has a as was uh, disclosed in the responsible ai for social empowerment summit uh, in october last year uh, which was done in line with the india's strategy for ai which focuses on responsible ai and ai for all the endeavor is that we need to build upon the skilled workforce that we have in the field of ai give them the right tools and give them the right uh, right learnings from researchers across the world in order to ensure that better solutions can be developed and any solution that is developed at population scale in a country like india becomes uh, ideally suited for deployment anywhere so with this in the background i welcome all the speakers today all the panelists we have a very uh, stellar lineup of speakers and some of them are have joined in from the us where it's pretty late in the in the evening so i am extremely grateful for all those who for, for christine and josh mm -hmm. who have been like uh, if i can use the phrase burning the midnight oil to ensure that we learn from them mm -hmm. so we must make uh, maximum use of it and we also have our own experts mm -hmm. uh, the globally renowned experts in the form of manish gupta rajesh and alok who will be sharing the insights into that so i welcome all of uh, all the participants and all the speakers for this session of ai pe charcha and with this i would request now manish gupta director google research india to give his opening remarks uh, thanks abhishek uh, for this opportunity so i thought i'll uh, so while we have work at uh, google research india going on in a number of areas that you touched upon agriculture health uh natural language processing to democratize access to information for every indian in their native language i thought given the whole pandemic situation that we are in i'll focus uh 
in this case my remarks on health which i believe again is a huge need uh, but i also see it as a as a leapfrog opportunity right so with this pandemic situation especially right we are all very painfully aware of the limitations of our health infrastructure uh, and th this is where i actually see us a silver lining in that cloud uh, because i mean what we have all over the world uh, what we call healthcare infrastructure is actually more of a sick care infrastructure right so all the hospitals that treat people when you fall sick and ultimately what you need uh, and what ai can enable are are these more proactive healthcare systems where you are uh focusing on preventive health you're focusing on early diagnosis and taking timely action and then you're even focusing on wellness uh so i'll give uh, just a few examples and and i think christine will will touch upon in fact some of these in even greater detail during her presentation uh i mean so so what ai can help you do as you start adopting these digital health solution right so of course you we uh, need to convert some of these health records and so on into digital form but as you are able to analyze all of this data in digital form uh, ai helps you predict potentially serious conditions before before it is too late right so we've seen examples of things like screening for diabetic retinopathy uh, which can prevent blindness uh amongst people who are affected by that condition and again uh, in india there's a real shortage of uh, ophthalmologists so so there was work done by our researchers that showed right that by analyzing these retinal fundus images you're able to diagnose that condition and potentially help uh now that person avoid blindness and likewise there's been additional work done uh by google researchers Uh, as well as the uh, outside community of researchers at at helping diagnose various forms of for instance cancer breast cancer lung cancer and so on and in in a lot of these cases early detection is really the key to achieving both better outcome for people as well as lower cost in terms of healthcare now taking that even further uh, uh, my view is a lot of the real action in health is going to shift to what happens before the hospital right when we are living our normal lives at home and at work uh we are using all these mobile devices we are using all these uh, beginning people are beginning to use wearables and so on through which a lot of kind of our uh various signals which are relevant for our health they can be captured and analyzed and and then timely interventions again can be can be done so so again i think christine will talk about some of the work that we have done with an ngo called arman on using the mobile device to deliver timely kind of helpful messages to expecting mothers so that they can uh, essentially avoid problems during their pregnancy there are efforts at our research lab right now also on uh uh prevention of cardiovascular disease right because i mean if you are able to through a combination of mobile and wearables you are able to infer the the amount of sleep a person is getting the kind of uh, food that they are eating um, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, how much they are walking and so on you can build essentially models uh, in terms of their risk uh, Uh, for cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease continues to be the number one killer of people both on the planet as well as in india uh, and and in fact the silver lining again in all of that is that these many of these are very preventable uh, there are analysis that cardiologists have done that suggest that you could either completely prevent or delay that adverse event that millions of people are having in the form of heart attacks and strokes by at least 10 to 15 years if you're able to do very simple things like build up these risk models and again convince people to adopt certain healthy habits um in the context of covid again i mean public health i mean likewise you can start to use some of these tools also for almost like 
surveillance of what's happening in terms of public health surveillance and and start informing policy makers uh, with 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 more meaningful data and and allow them to take more timely action uh, before the outbreak of diseases thank you so much manish and thank you everyone for being here today um i, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge the situation in india you know i, I have people on my team in india many of many of the people on my team have family in india all of us have friends in india um and so uh even as i'm really grateful that you're making time to talk to me today uh, i just want to acknowledge the situation in india and say that i'm happy for anything we can do to support um i did want to at least give you a bit of a diversion from that today a little bit of time thinking about ai and uh and hearing about the work we do I've been in this space a long time. I'm very passionate about it. I could probably talk for ages. Um, you know, um, as we were saying at the introduction, you know, I, I have uh, sort of a, a broad history in this space. Um, and my focus right now is really as close to the research as possible, looking at some of our, uh, our real fundamental innovations. And that's what I wanted to talk through with you today, sort of some of the beginnings and the foundations of what we're doing and looking ahead to the future, not just of the products we have today, but some of the direction that I see us going. So some of the questions that I, I thought would be good to tackle today is just like a, a high level look, what is machine learning? What can machine learning do? And then looking from there, like what are the kinds of advances? How do we do this responsibly? And like, how can we make these applications in a way that really benefit everyone? Um, so, so just uh, just touching on that a little bit, uh, it sounds like you guys have already had quite a few introductions to machine learning, but I find that there can be a lot of confusion about exactly what AI and machine learning are. So just to level set my view on machine learning, which is sort of how we think about things at Google, artificial intelligence, which gets a lot of play in the press, is this general concept of how to make things smart. That's the science involved in, in, in artificial intelligence. But the kind of work that we focus on at Google is machine learning, which is basically techniques that learn from data. And when you think about things that you would be able to learn from data, you're really looking at sort of input and output. You know, it's a very programmatic approach and it's a question around how can we do better at giving better output for different inputs? It's basically a big math challenge that's wrapped up in that. And as an example, um, you can think about it as if you're trying to design a system that's going to produce the best output, like you're going to do spam classification in email, you could think about it with a rules based system where every time you see spam, you flag it as spam and you learn certain keywords like Viagra is usually associated with spam and you could learn it that way. And then you end up with a really long rules list, but it's far more effective to develop a system that can sort of learn on the fly and adapt based on the data it sees and not just be stuck with these handwritten rule systems. And that's really at the heart of most of the machine learning that we do. And if you build upon that, you basically get into a bunch of different use cases. And I'm going to walk through a few examples of those use cases for you today. Um, specifically, I want to talk to you a little bit about classification, prediction, generation, and language understanding. Uh, classification is the first. It's pretty simple to understand. It's what we do every day when we look at the world. We can take pictures or we can take data and we can try and predict with some level of certainty what's in the data, what's in the image. So if we look at pictures, we can try and predict whether we're looking at a picture of, you know, a gas station, a grocery store, a restaurant. If we're listening to a sound, we can try and identify whether what we're hearing is bird song, is someone talking and what language it might be. Um, so we try and, and do these do these, take these signals, these data signals, and predict what's going on inside the signals. And one of the products you may be familiar with that uh, that's done this very successfully, this is a project that we first came out in um, summer of 2015, is Google Photos. Um, and the, the magic to me, I use Google Photos all the time, uh, particularly for family photos. The magic to me is that you can search for photos rather than having to file them and index them. So if I just want to find all the photos of my kid eating watermelon, I can find those photos. Or if I'm trying to remember that specific photo that one time at the birthday party with a friend of mine, you know, I, I can search for that specifically and it'll search through all of my photos and try and classify which ones 
meet that criteria and pull it forward. And this is a this is a hugely powerful feature, just speaking with my product hat on, that really unlocks search features for you and can really unlock access to multimodal data. So it's a very exciting use of AI technology um, that you know we just frankly get really excited about. And then of course, closely tied to classification is prediction. In classification, we're trying to predict what the classification is, or we can just do predictions straight up. Um, and you know, Manish was talking about this earlier, but the, um, the the flood forecasting work that we've been doing is a fantastic example of prediction. Um, this is work that we've you know obviously rolled out in uh, in Bihar as well as in several other places, and just looking at exactly where we think that we're going to see different things happening, where we're going to predict floods, where we're going to predict. Uh, there's so there's so many different things that we would try and use predictive um, predictive processes for. They're basically based on how much data we can get and how we can find patterns in those data in that data. Um, this is an image taken from I'm probably going to mangle the name. Apologies. Um, I think it's the Bhagalpur district um, in Bihar, and uh, we're really trying to improve our real world accuracy. Um, currently, right now, our, our flood systems cover about 42 million people, um, which has been uh, really fantastic, but we're working to bring these models more accurately to more places and to roll it out to um, to more places in the world because we really see the power and potential of this technology. Um, moving on, just to try and give you this glimpse of the breadth of things that we that we like to do with machine learning. One of my favorite things is around generation, and this is uh, definitely something that's more at the cutting edge right now. Rather than trying to look at existing data and predict what's happening or predict what we can pattern match from it, we try and generate, we try and create something new that we've modeled based on previous images. So we can try and generate text from videos, try and improve accessibility, captioning, we try and generate language, we're translating one language to another. Uh, and then one of my personal favorite projects is uh, generating musical melodies. Uh, you guys uh, may have seen this uh, last year for um, the Indian National Celebration. We had a huge, um, a huge project where uh, you could sing the Indian National Anthem, and we combined these together in a, uh, in a musical learning experience uh, that I thought was pretty fun. Jumping ahead to translation, I like to use translation as a specific example of the kind of ways in which machine learning technologies stack, because this is really combining a bunch of those different aspects that I just talked about. So first there's classification. Can we understand what's going on in this image? Then there's prediction. Can we predict what language we're, we're trying to translate from? And then there's generation. Can we generate the new word in the new language and then seamlessly insert that into the image? And so if you've ever traveled uh, to a country where you don't know the language, or in particular, if you don't know the script even, this is a hugely powerful tool. Um, you know, I've definitely used it traveling internationally, you know, understanding the meaning of signs. And this is the kind of moment for me that really brings home why I work in this space. Because even to me working in this space my whole career, this feels like a magic to me. You know, you're holding up your phone and like seamlessly on your phone, the translation happens. But actually we're just using several of these models, you know, the generative models and predictive models and classification models, and we're just stacking them together into a beautiful product experience that really solves a user problem in the moment that they have it. And that's what's the most exciting for me about AI, trying to, trying to combine these different approaches and bring it together and really move the needle for people at the time when they need it most. Um, I, I'm going to give you one more example, which is just talking about more broadly some of the work that we're doing right now in language understanding. When you think about the places where machine learning and AI touches the, the ways in which it can be really beneficial for society, there's something very fundamental about human language. It goes just beyond, beyond translation into really understanding and trying to be able to, you know, parse questions and really understand queries and results. This is fundamentally a hard challenge. And it's something that we work very closely with the Google Assistant team on and that we really try and build out for all of our users. Um, we have nine Indian languages in the Assistant. 
um, and we're, you know, continue to work on trying to, to broaden access to the assistant to different locations, different dialects, different uses. And, you know, we have a huge number of daily users, you know, including in India, people that, that really reach out to try and uh, get simple questions answered to more complicated questions answered. And all of that is sort of underpinned by our natural language work. So let me talk just for a minute about some of the recent advancements there, because natural language is an area where we've had really significant leaps in recent recent times. And again, I, I work in research. I'm very close to this. So I get very excited about these. Um, there's a lot of buzzwords that float around about AI. One that you may have heard is BERT. Um, BERT is a uh, BERT is an amazing way in which we were able to leapfrog some of our previous understanding of language techniques um, using some more advanced neural techniques and and sort of jump forward in our language understanding. I won't bore you with all of the math details. It's a very fun math challenge, but. What we basically have is sometimes when we have a real breakthrough in AI, we can really leap forward. And this was sort of a, a five-year leap forward in Google search from one level of improvement. And that's the kind of thing that I hope we continue to see more and more of in AI is, you know, these moments where we find something we can do that pushes forward a whole bunch of fronts. So this pushes forward language understanding, which pushes forward search, which can push forward translation. And it's just, creates a cascade follow-on effect. Um, BERT's also an example of one of the sort of larger language models that we've been having. And we've also been putting a lot of work into larger models and really trying to understand how we can, uh, how we can more readily capture all of the nuances of human language and understanding and you know, dialogue and engagement really bring some of this power into search understanding, into you know, conversation with the assistant. This is a pretty important area of research for us that we're spending a lot of time on, and I expect will be increasingly important when it comes to how we you know, design interactions with technology. Uh, another project that you may have heard about, it's been uh, definitely a huge and impactful research project is around federated learning. Um, federated learning is one of the ways in which we sort of separate personalization of models from models that are on the cloud. So when you think about, you know, working with machine learning systems and you think about the way in which we do modeling, the way in which we handle data, you know, typically there's a lot of information stored on the cloud for these systems, but you also want to have a, a local, more personalized copy where you know, your phone knows it's you, your phone has, you know, aspects of the model which can be personalized for you, can be very useful in voice technology in particular. And uh, it's actually quite challenging, but very important that we manage to separate these out. And we have a huge project around federated learning to enable this specifically. It's one of the most important tools we have in our privacy arsenal. Um, and then, uh, finally, I'm just going to touch on a couple of uh, almost more hardware specific things that are really forward looking. Because I think a lot of times when we're working on AI, when we're working on machine learning, there's a tendency to think just about the software, just about the code that's gonna be written that's gonna empower this. But a lot of the advances that we want to make, they do require significant improvements in, in hardware as well. Um, we have a couple of projects going on right now that I'm very excited about. One is our quantum project, um, where we have just, an, you know, an incredible series of leap forward in quantum computing. Uh, I'm not going to try and explain quantum computing in this short time period, but suffice it to say that it's very exciting. And it's a, a, a whole new style of computation and a whole new way of thinking about program design. It's, it's, a, it's a fundamentally different way to think about computer programming. And we think it's going to be very powerful for the future development of ML systems um, and a variety of other applications. And then the second is uh, looking at sort of purpose-built hardware accelerators that can really improve, you know, AI machine learning workloads specifically. So when we think about the clouds of the future, we think about the kind of computation that's going to be done in, you know, clouds in the future, you really see this proliferation of machine learning models. And so Google has invested very heavily in our TPU line, working on, you know, dedicated hardware that, you know, 
take sort of the fundamentals of AI um, computation, sort of the, the linear algebra, to come back to my math roots, that you do as you know, a regular part of machine learning, and it makes that really efficient and, and is really designed to be able to do that kind of computation at scale. And that's, that, that's really enabled us to make many of these breakthroughs. Um, so just, you know, what's next in AI looking forward? Obviously, there's a lot more research to be done. Um, I'm particularly excited about some areas, including um, working with small data sets, generative models, um, you know, continuing the research that, that we and others are doing on chips. And then, uh, you know, this kind of broader questions of understanding the real world, understanding language, understanding, you know, images and video perception technologies. I, I, these are all areas that I think are very exciting and, and going to be transformative in our lifetimes. Um, I'm also really excited about all of the different applications here. Um, and we can talk about some of that in a minute, but just looking at the kinds of places where we have the opportunity to really move the needle with AI. You know, I really feel like the sky's the limit. There's so many places where we can make the world a better place here. And I'm really excited about all of the possible applications. And likewise, I really want to see a, a beautiful interaction with our users. You know, looking at this with my product lens and, and thinking about how we want to impact our users in a positive way and um, really encourage this collaboration. It's, it's very core to what we try and do and to, and to how we're building these systems. Um, and probably one of the most important pieces of that from my perspective is responsible AI. I, I've been working uh, in this space for a long time now and have been very involved in Google's AI principles, which is a, uh, you know, uh, it's basically a charter for us about the kinds of work that we are and and, and are not going to try and do in AI. Um, sometimes I think it really helps to just just really write it down and, and take a look at what we're really trying to do here because it's not, you know, uh, it's not always as simple as just saying like. Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do good things. We're not gonna do bad things. I think it really helps to write this down, and uh, so we, you know, uh, Google's worked very hard to get a um, Google's worked very hard to get a thoughtful approach to this. I would say with a lot of input and cross-functional leadership, and our goal is to provide AI that is socially beneficial, that avoids creating and reinforcing biases. It's built and tested for safety and accountable to people, incorporating privacy design principles with high standards of excellence. And then just generally according with all of those principles, everything we build should be available. And that, that really combines with our open development mentality. You know, our goal is not to build AI just for Google. Our goal is to build AI to push the whole industry forward, to push the whole world forward. And when we work on our AI systems, there's a lot of structures that we have in place to try and ensure that the work that we do upholds those high standards and is adherent to our AI principles. So working both with all of the, the product areas, all working in tandem, we have dedicated team, the responsible innovation team that works through these principles um, that I work with quite closely. And we also have a number of senior executive advisors, council members, folks who are really subject matter experts in these areas that can consult with us on this. We take our responsibility in this space very seriously. Um, and one of the things that I, I've personally been very invested in is putting together the kinds of tools, techniques, and infrastructure that will enable us to set high standards for responsible AI. So looking at you know our open source tools around an analysis, uh, data cards, um, all of our work understanding you know constraints and building models that detect bias, and, and frankly just testing. Testing is a huge part of this, and I feel like there's a, a lot of work we do in computer science where we sort of test right at the beginning, but we don't always test continuously as we you know as we get more data as we continue to do these things and it's this mentality around testing and around continuing to see how our models operate that i think is really critical as we go forward um i have just a few more things that i wanted to share with you and of course they're very close to my heart because they're in india um we have a lot of investment obviously google has a lot of investment in india and we have a lot of exciting ai work that we try and do 
um, that we have done in India, you know, working with Manish and his team, but then just more broadly, we, um, one of the reasons that we open sourced TensorFlow was to see if we could get a lot more people using machine learning for a lot of different uses. And we've seen such a fantastic proliferation of use cases of AI in India, both, you know, that we've been working with directly um, uh, at Google and that we've had a lot of partners working at. And this is just so fantastic. Um, we, uh, when we look at all of the use cases that we see here, right, there's sort of use cases across all of the sectors. We see people using this for healthcare. You know, we ourselves are very involved in a lot of healthcare applications. There's agricultural applications, uh, governance applications, environmental applications. Um, to me, the exciting thing about AI is really that the sky's the limit. I have a couple of my favorite projects that I wanted to highlight to you. Um, one project, and I have young kids, so this is very close to my heart, is just looking at how we can increase outreach to mothers and reach them at a time when we're really going to have potential interventions and make sure that maternal health resources are available to everyone. And so we have some models that we use to try and understand how we can reach out to mothers more effectively and really try and, and target in that preventative way to make sure that mothers are getting the support that they need um, because maternal health care is such a huge, huge challenge. And to me, the whole statistic around maternal death and how, you know, almost 90% of maternal deaths are avoidable if only mothers receive timely intervention really motivates this work for me. And so I'm really excited that we're participating in it. Um, Another project, you know, we, we talked about this before, um, especially with the, the flood modeling that we've been doing in, uh, in Bihar, but, uh, and that project began in 2008 with our flood forecasting models. We've had a huge investment in this because floods are such a, such a devastating effect. Um, you know, there's, you know, tens of billions of dollars in economic damages every year, um, you know, thousands of people um, perishing in floods every year. This is a huge crisis that affects hundreds of millions of people around the world. And so we use machine learning in a lot of different places. First, we try and do better modeling just so that we can do better prediction of, of, um, of, the, um, of when floods might occur. Um, second, we have a project specifically around coverage where we're trying to reach out coverage. And actually in, in June of last year, we had an important milestone with our systems extending to all of India just in time for monsoon season uh, to be able to alert, to target and alert any possible flood in um, combination with the government systems. And then the last thing that we do is, is a, a smarter Android notification system. We've sent out about 30 million Android notifications to people in flood affected areas so far. Um, and those sort of targeted notifications are another huge way in which we're trying to make progress on this huge global challenge um, for which we really think AI can be a core of the solution. Um, Manish is, I, I think, going to speak a little bit more, but uh, it's been so wonderful partnering with him as the head of our Google Research India team. We have a lot of fantastic work going on there from peer research to product engagements. Um, and in particular, on this new product innovation, some of these examples that we've seen are AI for social good work, working with health, working with agriculture. And that's just a small part of Google's overall, you know, real investment in India. Um, our CEO, Sundar Pichai, recently announced a $10 billion India digitization fund. One of the big focuses for that for us is AI. And we believe that there could be huge social impact, um, particularly in agriculture, healthcare, and education. Um, those are areas that we really see a potential for huge impact from AI and are really excited to work on. Um, just, just one more example, because I can hardly resist giving you more examples of these things, is um, we have an AI-powered uh, read-along tutor app. Uh, and it's built specifically for India users and students learn, use the app to learn to read on their own. And, uh, you know, when you see children, you're learning to read on their own using this app, uh, learning to read a new word in Hindi for the first time. It's, it's so exciting. And we really started this project in India. Now we're rolling it out to, uh, 180 countries, children learning to read in nine languages. 
um, it's it's very exciting. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, let me uh, just say what an honor it is to be here, yeah. and particularly to following Christine, who's really one of the foremost experts, not only at Google, but in the world. Um, unlike, unlike Christine, I am not uh, an expert in artificial intelligence, um, but I did have the experience of helping agencies in the US government um, to apply and adapt these technologies. And that's the main thing that I wanna to talk to you today about the use of these um, technologies in the public sector and some of the challenges that you may encounter as you try to apply these to the incredibly important missions that you have. Um, so if we could, uh, if we jump aside. So my, my background, as I mentioned briefly, is I, I worked in the US Department of Defense um, and I got to help uh, create an innovation advisory board that was actually chaired by uh, the former CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt. And I helped develop the department's AI strategy, its AI principles, which were largely influenced by Google's principles, established the Joint AI Center, um, helped to establish the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, which released a, a 750 page, quite superb report uh, only uh, a few weeks ago, and I worked with the White House on helping them develop AI policy and strategy for the whole US government. Um, so I, I got to see a lot of the challenges and I wanna share some of those uh, learnings with you. So if we could uh, jump to the next slide. Um, so at its core, as you heard from Christine so eloquently, um, th this is a new technology for solving problems. And what the, what the people of India expect from their government leaders is to try to help them apply the latest technologies to solving urgent problems. And obviously today, all of us around the world are experiencing the crucial role the government needs to play in protecting the lives um, of, of their citizens. Um, so if, if we'll go to the, the next slide, what you can see uh, is that machine learning tools are, are very useful for narrow applications today, um, largely applications of perception and reasoning. Um, and there are a number of things that they can do uh, to automate what we would normally ask human beings to do, which creates all kinds of efficiencies and speed and performance. And there are certain things that they can do better than a human mind can do. We are nowhere near this question of general artificial intelligence about using judgment uh, and reasoning and things like that. It's more using machine learning as a tool um, to do certain things very well, usually working in concert with humans. And it's really, we find that the performance is best when it's the right combination of, uh, of people using human intuition, human, human judgment, um, hum, human decision-making combined with and augmented by machine learning from machines. And, and the sort of the axiom that I think of is we really want to try to help machines do what machines do best in order to have humans do what humans do best. And so the kinds of applications that, that we are seeing on my team at Google for using these kinds of technologies, you can see how numerous they are. These are only the ones that my team has been working with in the past year. Um, they generally, for us, fall into categories as diverse as science and innovation, justice, um, transportation, health and human services, and, and, and many, many different um, types of use cases in between. And you heard some amazing use cases from my, my two previous colleagues today, and, and I'll share a couple additional as well. Um, what it really comes down to is four basic ingredients that, that you need in your organization. Um, and I'll talk about each one specifically. It, it's thinking about the role that people play in the strategy and culture and judgment about the problems they choose to tackle and the skills and knowledge that they bring. It's having the data that you need to train the models. Um, and I'll talk a lot about data. It's computational resources that we use in order to process that data through the techniques like federated learning or other things that Christine mentioned. Um, and, then it, and then it's really the research tools or what we sometimes call the tooling that allows you to manage that data and make that data useful for, for, for reasoning or inference as we sometimes call it, for, for helping to make decisions or to deliver useful services. So let me just say a word briefly about each one. Um, so if we go to the, the next slide, please. Um, you know, people is really the area where, where I focused. And you see this very important chart on the left, the innovation adoption curve. And one of the things I really counsel 
public sector leaders to think about it, it, is to have in the back of your mind the idea that you're not just trying to prove out narrow pilot examples or test cases, but you're thinking about how do I have a strategy for the whole organization to drive adoption, to move from the innovation to the early adopters to the early majority and thinking about uh, how the particular uses of machine learning for particular missions will, will be applied and perceived more broadly. Um, and, and it really gets into the responsible AI use uh, and some of the other important questions about how to set up and design these experiments um, that we heard Christine talk about. Um, and, and I'll talk more about that at the end of my presentation with some, with some takeaways. When you think about the data, I can't stress how important this is. My experience um, working on, on projects in, in the US government, we often said that we spent about 80% or more of time and budget on what we called data wrangling. Um, ways to figure out how, what data we needed, clean the data, understand the data in context, get the data in the right format, the right, you know, get it in the right cloud, get it with the right uh, privacy rules, the right security rules. We spend more time on, on data than on algorithms or anything else. We find as organizations, only about 20% of the data the organizations are using, I often call it mission data, is structured. Um, it doesn't mean that all of that data is structured in a way that makes it useful to combine, um, but it means that it is in a structured format that is intelligible as structured by a human or a machine. 80% of that data is unstructured, um, and we usually have in the past only focused our analytical efforts on the structured data or spend a lot of time cleaning data to try to make data that is unstructured, semi-structured. But one of the incredible power and promise of machine learning is the ability to make use of that unstructured data. Um, but you really have to be thoughtful and intentional about how we do that. Um, and machine learning is a useful tool for making unstructured data usable, but it is always easier to apply machine learning to relatively more structured data sets. And we can talk a little bit more about data later on. Um, last, you need computational resources. And, you know, one of the things that is really exciting, and, and you heard Christy talk about this, is we are, we are finding ourselves able to do more and more and more sophisticated machine learning applications with less and less compute resources. At the same time, it is also true that the more and more sophisticated applications of machine learning appear to be more and more data intensive than ever before. So you have this interesting paradox, and in either case, what we find is that access to these compute resources is crucial to your effort. And that's a big reason why cloud computing companies have played such a large role uh, in this revolution in machine learning, because we make those computing resources available to you. And the most important thing is it's elastic because it's uh, complicated and expensive to maintain computing resources. So, you know, it's great for a public sector to have access to uh, a lot of these resources through a cloud because you only have to pay for what you need and you don't have to maintain uh, you know, high performance computing capability at scale. Uh, and so that, that's been a really important feature of it. Another really important feature that we bring is about democratizing the use and access of, of, to manage that data and to use the cloud computing resources, that data by, by creating tooling. And what I mean by tooling is you think that there's a sort of progression of the most sophisticated techniques that Christine and her team would develop being more and more automated into no code or low code solutions to make it easier for people like me who actually don't know how to write any code to use some of these tools. And so one of the things that our, our studies have shown is that there really are only about 10,000 people um, in the, on the entire world who do the kind of deep learning work or super sophisticated cutting edge work that Christine and her team does. Um, but there are uh, 2 million in the world who can use these machine learning automated platforms like AutoML. Um, there are 23 million developers and 100 million mission users. So you think about what we mean by democratization. We mean that, um, you know, using the right set of tools or toolkits uh, to access that data allows people at varying degrees of technical sophistication to be able to reap some of the rewards and benefits of machine learning. It may be less sophisticated, but it really allows agencies to do to do much, much more. And when you consider, uh, you know, that all all government agencies around the world, in the United States particularly, you know, I I experienced this myself, 
has really varying degrees of sophistication and expertise in computer science and particularly this particular branch of it. And so to make this really accessible for the mission, you want to try to democratize the tools as much as possible to make them widely available. And so I think that's another reason why it's really important to get the tooling right. Um, so if you move to, to, to this idea, it's it's really what this, what this set of, of facts presents you with is essentially two basic paths. Um, one is to build some of these tools yourself. Um, and the second is to buy these services from, from a provider. And there are strengths and weaknesses to those approaches. And what's really crucial is choosing the right approach for the problem that, that you are trying to solve. And there may be certain, you know, particularly novel applications, newer applications, unique problems that really require you to have your own sort of uh, AI lab, if you will, and build these techniques yourself. For a lot of other challenges, you know that maybe it's it's a it's a it's more of an automation challenge, and you may be able to use ensembles of available or publicly available um, vision or language tools that you can use to achieve the effects you need for your mission. And so you know, we'll talk a little bit more about the strengths and weaknesses of these two approaches and, and which is right um, for your organization's mission. Typically what that looks like, particularly um, in the, the latter case of, of adapting more commercial services, is you have to follow a fairly predictable path. The first is choosing the right problem, identifying the challenge you're looking to solve, the mission you're looking to meet. You have to develop a hypothesis about, about the data. What do you believe the data will show you and how might machine learning help you achieve that? Then you have to see whether or not the data that you need to answer that question or to prove or disprove that hypothesis is available. And often this is where a lot of these machine learning problem, you know, approaches may uh, may stop because it may be that it's difficult to get that data um, or for a wide variety of reasons. But once you have a theory of the case and an approach and the data, you have to make the build versus buy decision. And I put buy in quotes there because there's many different ways to buy these tools, but it's really this question of, you know, how experimental or novel is this application and how much custom AI development do you think you need to do to fit your data and to fit your models, your algorithms to train those, the data versus something there where you can uh, stand on the shoulders of, of others um, and import models that they may have for, let's say, um, you know, natural language processing of a language or uh, uh, algorithms for detecting certain images. And once, once you've chosen those models, you train on that data, um, and then you're able to inference from the data to train the algorithm in order to try to understand how to apply that to a tool. And then you need to build that into services. So using machine learning by itself is really only gonna get you so far. I think what's so crucial is being able to apply it to the mission. I wanted to share with you sort of six uh, and really important lessons um, that I drew from my experience sort of working across the US government. Um, first, it's so important to choose the right problem to solve. Uh, oftentimes, uh, leaders are looking to demonstrate that a particular government agency can adopt AI. And so they often choose problems that lend themselves to, to applying machine learning because that's the objective they've been given. But they end up sort of winning the battle and losing the war because they didn't actually choose something that was either specific enough or meaningful enough to deliver a mission outcome that people really cared about. Um, and so, or they, or they may choose something that people deep care deeply about, but it's such a complex problem. Um, we often talk about how machine learning doesn't always escape the lab because there may be, you know, uh, you know, scientific organizations or research organizations that are working on machine learning or trying to understand the state of the art of machine learning in academia or, or, uh, you know, companies like ours, but they're not actually solving a problem for, for a citizen. And so we think choosing the right problem to solve. Um, is so important. The second lesson we learned is really the crawl, walk, run. And this gets at what I was saying earlier about, you know, you know novel AI applications versus um, commercial techniques that have been proven to work um, at scale across multiple industries or for other government agencies. And what I found is that it, it really often behooves the government to try to use um, open source tools or commercially available tools for automation to build confidence early. Um, once you have a few of these under your belt and you've experienced what the sort of unique dynamics are 
um, of how to apply these tools to your mission and experience some of the privacy challenges or responsible AI challenges you may come across or you've learned about sort of figuring out what's what's the right sort of multi-cloud strategy that you need to sort of figure out what kind of talent you need, then that's a really good time to progress to some of these novel applications. But I really encourage, um, uh, you know, partners in, in government to not jump right into the hardest use cases and, and to make good use of the, of the university or commercial resources that may be available to them, um, where a lot of the kinks have been ironed out and it really helps you focus on the parts of the problem that are unique to the government challenge. And then third, I, I just want to emphasize this again, it's really usually data is the thing that gets in the way. Um, so go, giving yourself enough time and enough extra budget cushion to, uh, and getting the right expertise, um, thinking through what we call the data wrangling, that is usually 80% of the challenge. So I think it's really important to, to factor that in as part of your strategy and your approach. Um, often I think people are focused on the algorithm um, and actually I think it's the data that trains the algorithm that usually is so significant. Let's move to the last slide. And I just wanna point out that as much as artificial intelligence is about this exciting new frontier of technology um, and you know the most advanced machines, even, even you know, quantum computing, at the end of the day, human intelligence matters more for adopting artificial intelligence. Uh, one of the things that's been a huge challenge um, for, for the US government is getting access to talent pipelines so that there are enough people in government who are really sophisticated about how to be a savvy consumer. Government does not need to be able to build all of this technology themselves, but they do have to have that cadre of people inside who can be savvy consumers of this technology to make sure government is getting a great value um, and really protecting the taxpayer dollars and protecting the public interest. And for that, you have to have um, you know, a, at least a, a small number of, of really superb and well-informed uh, AI, AI experts. And then, and then you, you need to have a bunch of people that can figure out, you know, how to be good partners with industry or academia. Second, transparency really matters. There are a lot of public narratives about AI um, that make people concerned. Um, questions we've already heard about, uh, you know, jobs, opportunities, and other things potentially being taken away. Um, Christine raised privacy concerns and other, other things are really important. And what we've learned is that transparency is the best way to handle these concerns. It's important to be really intentional with the public about what you're doing and why and what precautions you're taking and what the benefits will be, because we really want to boost public confidence in AI as it's applied to public good. And lastly, it's really important to make government a role model in the responsible use of AI. And I thought Kristen did a beautiful job of talking about how Google does this, but it also was one of the things I was most proud of in my government career was helping to develop a set um, of AI principles um, for, for the use of, of AI by government. Um, and so uh, the, the next thing I wanna talk about is, it, it is really often not innovation, but innovation adoption that is the challenge. And so. You know, we are so preoccupied often with the technical challenges that we forget that most challenges are actually organizational in nature. Um, you know, there there are incredible AI researchers and amazing AI companies out there, um, and they've often solved a lot of the really difficult technical problems um, for a lot of the mature use cases. Um, what we often find is difficulty is actually organizational in nature. Bureaucratic rivalries, um, you know, uh, various rules and regulations, um, all, all kinds of challenges around, uh, you know, contracting and, and those sorts of things. And so don't assume that the most complex AI, AI uh, tools that may be, may be available to cutting edge researchers are not available to government because, because they're too technically complex. That's actually not the issue. The issue usually is that um, government is, is difficulty changing its behavior and adopting any new technology. And it turns out that machine learning is no exception. Um, so one of the things I advise is thinking about scale and about comparative advantages. Really, the best thing for government to do is figure out what are the things that business is really, really good at or that universities are really good at and let, the, let those organizations do those things and focus on the things that government is uniquely good at. And usually, that is being, being a good steward of public sector resources, um, being focused on a public sector mission, 
looking out for the needs of citizens, really knowing and having empathy for the needs of citizens and trying to figure out how to address those issues in a partnership um, with a company. And that is really the way to achieve scale. What we've seen sometimes is that some governments really want to achieve that scale on their own. Um, and that puts them in a difficult situation um, because companies have invested a lot of money in building the scale, uh, scale and expertise of AI. Um, and so now uh, you know, we find that it's so important um, for government to figure out how to do what government really can uniquely do best. And then last, I would say AI is an ecosystem. Um, it's not a system that you can buy. It's not software that you can download. Um, it's not something you can hire a consulting firm to do for you. It's the ecosystem of all those things connected together. Um, and so I, I, I think it's, it's sort of a combination of culture, people, expertise, responsibility, data, computing resources, all of those things together. And so it's best to think of it as an ecosystem. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Just wanted to share a little bit of context for how we're thinking about how AI can help in the current pandemic. Uh, I know we did mention in the intro that this is definitely top of mind for all of us at Google. Again, uh, the situation in India is very dire. So really looking at how we can use technology to help support some of these uh, social issues. Give you a quick overview of how Google is trying to help policymakers during COVID-19. Essentially, given Google's global mission, we do want to make data and tools available to public health researchers and policymakers to inform their decision making. There was a question on how data and analytics can be used uh, to help in areas like healthcare and agriculture and education. And this is a perfect example of that. Google makes several open data sets publicly available. Uh, the idea is for researchers uh, to be able to use some of these across different countries to be able to, again, devise public policies to help you know, address some of these public emerging public health issues. We also share what we call community mobility reports, which are aggregated data sets that help analyze what are the movement patterns, especially helpful in the current phase when we're imposing lockdowns from a district and city level, where we try and understand if there is a lockdown, what has the impact been on movement patterns? And we source this data from multiple sources, including Google Maps at an aggregated level, keeping in mind that we need to ensure that the privacy of users are ensured. But this has been particularly helpful to understand, for example, the spread of COVID, the community spread of COVID in certain districts. There are research reports that have been published based on Google's community mobility reports. And I would encourage you all to have a look at some of those studies to see how they can be applied. And the last piece is what we want to really focus on today is how we use forecast models and simulation agents to help, again, inform public policy and policymaker decisions in terms of what they can do to help understand the ongoing pandemic and also understand what they can do to help mitigate those issues. Hi, folks. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, so this study, uh, it sort of predates the current situation. It was uh, studied during the last three months of the previous year when we were in the phases of unlocking and uh, the study focused on uh, using uh, like reopening of mass transit particularly uh, local trains in Mumbai um, and uh, we had a proposal for reopening in a safe manner uh, particularly uh, using uh, cohorts and this study is published now uh, at AMAS, which is uh, a, a major conference uh, using multi-agent systems. So we had a proposal, uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, focused on the idea of cohorts. So cohort members share origin and destination. So of all the group who want to use locals, we form cohorts and cohorts have a certain size. We'll get uh, into this a little bit later. Uh, and each cohort travels together. Um, can we go to the next slide? Uh, so as cohorts are traveling together, uh, COVID can spread amongst the cohorts based on uh, the time uh, that they overlap with each other. Uh, and the, the key idea here is that if any member of the cohort is identified to be symptomatic, then uh, you quarantine the entire cohort thus reducing the spread uh, from asymptomatic spreaders. Um, can we move to the next slide? So here we have a visualization that explains this much better. So 
So we divide the entire population based on their origin and destination uh, stations. And then as they enter the station, now this is only an example, um, we somehow screen them, whether it is temperature or some other means uh, is not part of the study. To what extent is that effective? So one could bring uh, such strategies uh, and uh, uh, see how they work in the uh, simulation models. And then that would enable us to compare strategy A versus strategy B. Uh, we think that this kind of a tool must be in the uh, toolkit of every city planner and every city uh, management. And we hope that uh, uh, going forward, these kinds of tools are used to a large extent to understand how uh, uh, certain decisions will pan out and uh, guide uh, decision making. This is basically the basic math behind our modeling. Uh, to translate it into English, basically, um, COVID can transfer between two people uh, only if both of them are together sometime. Uh, and, uh, and at least one of them has COVID and the other one is susceptible. Uh, next slide. Uh, like our, our modeling is built on some assumptions, uh, 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 which is like our limitations of data. Uh, we only consider uh, the, the BMC limits because that's what uh, census data was available for. Um, so our trains only run within the limits of uh, BMC, even though in reality they run much beyond uh, the city limits. Uh, we don't model interactions at the stations and we assume that we have a unlimited number of coaches. Uh, now, I would like to point out that uh, our study is fairly general. Like, you know, it's like not, none of these things are very specific to Mumbai or to locals. Uh, this could be applied to any sort of means of public transportation in any city. And we, we expect these results to be fairly general. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, one other thing to uh, understand is that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. This is the famous quote, and this is true in our case, uh, assuredly. Um, the, the raw numbers that we had in all of our graphs are uh, most certainly going to be wrong. But the, the purpose of showing these things is not to focus on the raw numbers, but to understand the relative impact of uh, different policies uh, that we would implement and how they would affect the spread of COVID. Thank you. Yes, we make federated tools available for a larger ecosystem. Um, this has been particularly powerful with the Android ecosystem. Uh, when you think about the kinds of things that we expect AI to be able to do in everybody's daily lives, it still feels like we've really just scratched the surface. You know, um, there's lots of times when like you want to have really powerful techniques, voice recognition, photo search, just, you know, anything that you're, that you're carrying around with you in your regular life and the potential to uh, to separate out your model so that you have more personalization, so that you have more privacy preservation, uh, has a huge potential sort of across the board. And this is something that we've invested very heavily in and are really excited to see more use of, especially as we see more and more uses of AI. I think one of the things that uh, I think about this uh, this question a lot, the question of the future of work and how, you know, how we can, what, what we're going to spend our time on as a society. You know, it's just, just even in my career, I've seen a lot of shifts between the kinds of work that people are focusing on and the kinds of tools that people are using, the increased digital literacy is such a huge change, even just in my in my lifespan, in my career. And I think that what I see huge potential for in AI is certainly twofold. There are certainly open questions around like what kinds of work will change 
with AI tools. What I've seen so far suggests that AI has the power to unlock more creativity. There's a lot of things which are very rote, which we can work on, which we can improve with AI, but there's also a lot of places where we can empower people to be more creative, where we can empower people to work more efficiently, where we can empower people to do more and touch more people. And that, uh, that potential, I think, is pretty huge. Um, I don't want to dismiss the concerns about, you know, what the future of work looks like, because I do think that this is something that we have to look at holistically as a society, not just with AI, but with technology in general. But I do also think that of all of the, the types of technology that I've, I've worked with in my career, I gravitated towards AI because I think it has the most power to uplift and empower people to do the kind of work that they want to do, to be more effective, to be more creative, to connect better with each other. And uh, so I, I, I do think that that's important and important enough that I've certainly spent my career on it. As to the question of uh, how you can do more work in AI, um, I think there are a lot of dimensions to that. You know, I get asked this question a lot by computer scientists, engineers. Um, I point them to our, you know, TensorFlow tutorials, our online courses that we've put together, um, a lot of the training on that. But I also think that there are uh, there are larger questions that are that are outside of just the engineering. I work so closely with our cross-functional partners, you know, our legal and policy teams, um, our educators, and there's a whole ecosystem of of thinking about how we how we work with AI systems and how we develop these questions and just thinking about what new problems we can solve that we wouldn't have been able to solve before and how to fit those into the sort of fabric of existing workflows. That's not really an engineering challenge. It's really more of an application challenge. And to me, that's probably even a bigger growth area. Um, so I'd say, you know, maintain an interest, read up on this and see if you can think about use cases where you can actually put this into practice for yourself. Definitely a huge and impactful research project is around federated learning. Um, federated learning is one of the ways in which we sort of separate personalization of models from models that are on the cloud. So when you think about, you know, working with machine learning systems, without knowing the the problem we're trying to solve or the, or the data that we're trying to annotate, it's hard to speak specifically about which tools, but I think that the short answer is um, yes. You know, we we spend a lot of time trying to think about, about data in terms of pipelines um, and, and in order to, you know, maintain the accuracy of models and to continuously update them. And so uh, that is part of the services that, that we offer or, or that you would want to, you know, procure from whichever company is supporting you. And so I, I, annotation is a really important part, both the, um, you know, correlation of data with other data sources and also metadata that you would need to record on whatever particular kind of data you're looking. But I think it, it matters enormously, whether it's, you know, text or it's imagery, um, or you're looking at, um, uh, you know, telemetry or other things like that. But I think the short answer is, is yes, absolutely. Uh, we could uh, um, take a look at, and particularly with Google's uh, uh, access to the kind of searches that people are making, uh, we uh, uh, should be able to uh, um, gather evidence or intelligence on uh, which areas are seeing a higher inquiry for uh, perhaps uh, certain kind of remedies and things like that. Uh, so that would be one uh, way in which we could uh, we could, we could use text-based intelligence. Another uh, text-based intelligence that I uh, think uh, is already in place is uh, we have had about 100,000 publications in the last one year alone on uh, COVID-19. And uh, there, is a, uh, there is a lot of information. Some of it were done at the exploratory phase. Some of it which have been, uh, uh, which are based on systematic trials uh, after uh, um, significant experiment design and uh, rigorous uh, experimentation. So uh, text-based uh, processing uh, of all of these papers and uh, uh, trying to identify a bunch of uh, 
hypotheses or important papers that one could look at or hypotheses that one could pursue uh, is another way in which uh, uh, text-based processing can help perhaps more researchers uh, than uh, the common public. Those are two things that I thought which could immediately answer the uh, question. Thank you. In fact, uh, I can't thank, uh, uh, thank the panelists enough. In fact, it has been such an engaging session. In fact, uh, uh, we shared the link on social media and we shared the link on all our uh, Meti groups. And people who joined in late, they were like messaging ki why we did we not inform them earlier. So the session by Christine or Josh or uh, Rajesh and Alok, it has really, really been engaging the way Christine began with the basics of AI and explained how it maps up, how it can be applied in various uh, use cases and then gave certain examples that was really, really brilliant, especially the use cases when we deal with the language uh, adaption of uh, artificial intelligence. That's something we are working on in the National Language Translation Mission. And uh, I'm sure the, the learnings of Google would have a lot of uh, benefits as we move ahead on the National Language Translation Mission. Josh, the way he kind of presented the, you, the application of AI in public, uh, uh, in the public space and how governments can adopt it and what are the key issues and where all very often what happens in the, in the governments is that we know this is exciting we know this works very well but to actually apply it there are multiple challenges there are procurement challenges there are contractual challenges there are uh, and, and very often the pilots don't scale up so what we need to now focus and some of the slides that uh, Josh presented would have great learnings in, in the ways we can move uh, move on from a proof of concept or a pilot to a full scale rollout. Because AI is not something that's, uh, the, it's not a technology of the future. It's like in the present, it has been there for a long time and the applications which have been done, they work. So there is no reason that if something has worked in Bihar, why can't it be rolled out elsewhere? If something has uh, worked for detecting blindness, why can't we use it for uh, larger use in uh, and providing basic health care for people who don't have access to quality health professionals. So the presentation was Josh was brilliant. I'm very grateful and thankful to you. And uh, Rajesh and Alok, the, uh, the de demo that they gave with regard to how crowding leads to more cases and how COVID modeling uh, can be done using artificial intelligence. So the insights that we got from today's sessions were really, really relevant. So I thank the, all the speakers, all the panelists and Manish for leading the AI research in India for Google and and he is like a kind of for all the people who are working in the field of AI they look up to him and they follow his work and I am sure uh, going ahead in our journey for artificial intelligence we'll have many more opportunities to listen to uh, these experts and learn from them. I'm thankful to Amlan and uh, Aman and Pratik for uh, enabling this and my entire team of National Governance Division who had been uh, working hard on this, Brahma, Bernali, and the, uh, and all those in our LMS team. So I extend my gratitude and thanks to them and all the participants who have joined in. I am sure you will be carrying this forward. This recording will be available on the, our LMS portal and uh, those who have missed it can see this. And uh, with these words, I conclude this session with, you know, with thanks to all. Thank you. <laughs>